I'm Tiffany. Uh, I work with Real Food Media, a nonprofit that focuses on storytelling, critical analysis, and strategy for the food movement. Um, thank you so much for joining us on day three of the Oxford Real Farming Conference. We're all here today, or in this session, to learn about indigenous food systems with Lila June. Um, indigenous food systems have been devised over hundreds of years to like nourish and replenish the people as well as the earth. And over the course of the past two to 300 years, settler colonialism has tried its best to destroy that knowledge, to erase those practices, as well as the people themselves. And Lila June, like others before her, have been working to, pre to preserve and share that knowledge. So Lila is an indigenous musician, scholar, and community organizer um, of the Navajo, Cheyenne, and European lineages. Her dynamic multi-genre presentation style has engaged audiences across the globe towards personal, collective, and ecological healing. And she blends studies in human ecology at Stanford, graduate work in indigenous pedagogy, and the traditional worldview she grew up with to inform her music, perspectives, and solutions. Um, yeah, so Lila, thank you so much for joining us. maybe it's oh there it is okay thank you for having me tiffany it's wonderful to be introduced by you um so yeah first i would like to introduce myself in my uh mother tongue just to honor my ancestors so yeah <laughs> Um, Taos, New Mexico, so um, what I just said was greetings, my kin and my people. I come from the Black Charcoal Street Division of the Red Running Into Water Clan of the Diné Nation. Uh, we are also sometimes incorrectly known as Navajo. Uh, my father's mother is of the Cheyenne Clan. My mother's father is of the Salt Clan of the Diné. And my father's father is of the European clans, as far as I know. Um, I hail from Taos, New Mexico, and um, I, in that matter, present myself as a Diné woman. So that's what I said. Um, and I just wanted to uh, share today about indigenous food systems and their corresponding land stewardship practices, and also give a little uh, musical performance at the end. Um, and we'll have time for questions about 20 minutes till the hour. So f feel free to write questions down as I go along. So I am knee deep or waist deep, or maybe up to my eyeballs, I don't know, one of those in my doctoral research uh, in terms of really examining different indigenous communities, both contemporary and pre-Columbian, who really did an incredible, beautiful, extraordinary job of cultivating these vast um, food systems on a bioregional level. In other words, we're not talking about a little acre plot here of, of corn and a little acre plot there of, of a squat or whatever. We're talking huge landscape scale sized food systems that were managed extensively. Now this flies in the face, right, of the dominant narrative of indigenous peoples because a we weren't supposed to be here in that grade of numbers which has been debunked we were here in massive numbers b we weren't supposed to be smart enough to uh, deliberately sculpt the way that huge land bases looked and tasted turns out we were that smart in fact far ahead of our uh, counterparts in other parts of the world and and three we weren't supposed to be have been here that long uh, tiffany said hundreds of years we've been here I know this is a controversial statement, but hundreds of thousands of years and all of this data is coming out and it keeps getting swatted down by the Eurocentric scientific community saying, oh, that's outlier data or that's not true or that's not right. But at the very least, we agree uh, that we've been here 14,000 years, which is a gross underestimate. So in any case, these food systems were, let me give you a few examples, because that's the best way I have found to be able to describe what I'm talking about, because there really are no words in English that I have found, <laughs> truly, after studying this intensively for three years, to describe what we did. Okay, so one of the groups I like to talk about is the Heltzuk Nation of 
Bella Bella, British Columbia, an island on the west coast of Canada. They actually hand plant kelp forests, uh, which expand the herring spawning grounds. Uh, the herring is a little silver fish. Silverfish comes, litters the whole place with eggs. And these eggs provide a caloric base for not just food for humans, but for the salmon and the killer whales in turn, the wolves, the bears, um, all of the animals will come to the shoreline as the tide recedes and will start eating up these eggs. And so it's just beautiful how this food system is not domesticated so much. You know, they're not caging all the herring fish in a little tank and saying, lay eggs. They're actually, in a way, almost luring or seducing them to come to their uh, to their to their homelands to lay eggs. It's like more of a um, it's more of like habitat expansion where we create a home and our food comes to us. It's more very consensual. Um, and so that's quite beautiful because this food system is not just designed to feed humans. It is designed to feed all life because they share this caloric base and they intentionally create this caloric base to support the food web of the entire island system. Uh, some of their cousins a little further south uh, they create clam gar. Well, actually, all throughout the Salish peoples, which are the Pacific Northwest indigenous peoples, create these clam gardens. But there's one island in particular where archaeological studies have been carried out along the shoreline of this massive island, and they found that 35% of the shoreline, one third of the entire shoreline, had ancient clam gardens. Now, what is a clam garden? A clam garden is essentially okay, here's the, here's the ocean, right? Or here's the land and here's the shoreline and, and the shore kind of goes down. They will actually put some uh, rocks up and rocks up here to create a little, uh, increase the level of the uh, ocean floor just a little bit to create, again, expanding the habitat for clams that clams enjoy. And what you have is a proliferation of clams where you didn't have one before. And so these are anthropogenic, meaning man-made habitats. Uh, and yet they are not domesticated in the sense that we think about. Uh, nothing is controlled or forced to live there. They are actually invited and go willingly to live there. So another example of this is the Great Plains. As we all know, the buffalo uh, constituted a very important part of the Plains diet. Uh, this buffalo was sacred to us. It provided food, clothing, shelter. It taught us so much. We, we, would, we would examine the buffalo and see how they operated and their community systems and how they took care of each other. The buffalo was and still is a huge central part of our entire nutritional, spiritual, social life. Interestingly, people think we followed the buffalo which to some extent is true. But what people don't understand is that the buffalo also followed us because we created buffalo habitat. How did we do that, you ask? Well, one of the things that we have documented, and when I say we, I mean the larger scientific community, um, is in Montana, you see these uh, ancient, uh, they call it pyro herbivory, which means burning the land to inject phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen, other nutrients into the soil through the ash and you also inject charcoal pieces and these little charcoal pieces are like miniature apartment buildings for microbes because there's little tiny holes in all the charcoal so it stimulates microbial activity generating a living soil and this in turn creates nutrient dense grasslands and who loves nutrient dense grasslands but undulates such as buffalo deer and other um, of other of our four-legged relatives. So this is another example of habitat expansion. So another thing I want, I like to talk about is the, um, the forestry practices of indigenous peoples. Just incredible, absolutely incredible. There is a pond in Kentucky that scientists have uh, extracted soil cores from this pond. And the soil cores are not that long, I think they're about 10 feet deep, and they will analyze each level of sediment, and they will date each level of sediment. And this particular cores, they found that the lowest level that they had 
was 10,000 years old, meaning the sediment was deposited into the pond 10,000 years ago. Um, and in this soil core, we find fossilized pollen. And that is the study of palynology, where you will study fossilized pollen in an effort to somewhat reconstruct the forest composition of that area throughout time. Because as the pollen falls on the surface of the pond, it settles to the bottom of the pond and fossilizes. And we know when it fossilized through radiocarbon dating. So it's really fascinating that this particular pond showed us that 3,000 years ago, the ancestors, presumably of present-day Shawnee, who were kicked out of Kentucky a long time ago, um, that they managed a hickory nut, chestnut, black walnut, sumpweed, goosefoot, all of these edible plant species suddenly rushed into the pollen profile 3,000 years ago. There was none of these edible plant species for 7,000 years. And then boom, in the late Holocene, somebody moved in, completely transformed the forest from cedar and hemlock to a food forest. Interestingly, we also find an influx of fossilized charcoal at this time, indicating that these ancestors managed this food, fire, uh, food forest with low intensity fires, low intensity burns. Now, why would you do such a thing? Why would you burn the same forest that you are trying to procure food from? <clears throat> well, the answer is this from what we understand. You will, again, inject nutrients into the soil. You will also eliminate competing vegetation. Because you have to remember in Kentucky, these types of woodland areas, it is a very heavily wooded area. And all of these trees are fighting for limited nutrients, water, and sunlight. And they're all fighting for the canopy to get a chance to get some of that sunlight. So what you have in an unmanaged forest, which is all around there in the south and in the east, is a bunch of trees overcrowding fighting for the can they grow straight up they're not a, they're not really allowed to kind of flower out the way a tree might wish that it could um, and so these Shawnee ancestors would burn to eliminate competing vegetation as well as bring nutrients into the soil as well as clear the understory for again deer and even wood bison and so you essentially create an Eden uh, and this uh, is 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 reflected in the lunar calendars of some of the indigenous nations throughout the continent. Uh, one in particular that I think of is the Miamia. The Miamia are indigenous to the Ohio River Valley, what we now call the Ohio River Valley. And they have a, burn, uh, a moon called the grass burning moon. And the grass burning moon is always the same moon every year. And this indicates that for eons, this nation, along with many others, had a very systematic prescribed burning schedule. And these are low intensity burns. You're not going and burning down the whole forest. You're just burning the forest floor. And because you do it every year, there's not much of a fuel load. There's not much debris to create a catastrophic fire. Now, this happened throughout California, as we all, many of us here know that indigenous prescribed low intensity burns, uh, you know, John Muir and all the conservationists might say, oh no, don't burn the forest. They, no, they don't understand. That gentle fire, that gentle pressure that indigenous peoples distributed throughout California is part of what could have prevented the California wildfires. When you do not manage the forest correctly, you have many, many, many sick, dried out trees because they're all competing for limited sunlight, water, and nutrients. They're, not, they're immunocompromised because they don't have enough nutrients. They're getting inbred as well because they're too close together. And you have a huge sick forest that is prone to catastrophic fire. When you thin the forest, just as you would thin your garden and weed your garden, we would do that, but on a forest level scale. So this is important to think about because in uh, Santa Cruz, California, you have the Amamutsun Nation. And I spoke with the, um, with the chairman, Val Lopez, and he said his understanding was from his oral history is that their rule of thumb was 13 trees per acre. 
And the reason they did that was to give the trees space to be what they are. And many explorers and pirates who came to this land, uh, they call themselves explorers. In many ways, they were a little bit more like pirates. Um, and so when they came, they often write in their diaries, wow, we came upon the land and it looked like an expansive park. You always hear that word park. It looks like a park, like as if somebody managed this whole thing. Well, somebody did. A lot of times these explorers were coming upon massive civilizations that had been depopulated because by the time anyone started writing history about these um, these places, a lot of us had already died off to disease. And so they're seeing these huge remnants of massive civilizations that had been almost completely depopulated. They estimate about 98% of indigenous peoples were depopulated due to disease in the very early years of colonization. Um, so these are some of the examples I like to talk about. Um, other examples, uh, so I guess maybe you're seeing from, uh, what I'm saying, and I'm actually shocked it's only been 17 minutes, but um, sorry if I've been talking too fast, but essentially what we're seeing is indigenous peoples did not so much farm the land. Instead, they tended the land, uh, as in the famous book by M. Cat Anderson, Tending the Wild, uh, where she talks about California indigenous land management and how that enhanced the natural food bearing capacity of the land. And so this is important because it teaches us as present day farmers, present day um, food activists, that what does it look like to not only feed humans, but to feed the entire ecosystem? What does it mean, as Vandava Shiva said, to give nitrogen to the soil as a sacred offering, to give phosphorus to the soil as a sacred offering, to actually nourish the entire system. And how can we uh, procure food in ways that is not intensive or domesticated, but ways that simply invites the life of the planet to thrive? One interesting thing is that these food systems also engendered and cultivated biodiversity. Um, you have, according to a recent UN report, indigenous peoples only being 5% of the planet, meaning they are in their original territories that they've been in for thousands of years. And these folks, this 5% of the world population is only, uh, is rather overseeing 80% of the world's biodiversity, 80 percent of the world's biodiversity. These folks are holding tenure over about 20 percent of the land's surface. So five percent of the population overseeing 20 percent of the earth's surface, overseeing 80 percent of global biodiversity. To me this is stunning and and if there wasn't any proof that maybe we should listen to indigenous peoples and if that isn't proof of that I don't know what is. But that's an interesting thing about indigenous food systems. And I know a lot of us here already know the fallacies of monoculture agriculture. So I don't need to preach to the choir. But I will say that indigenous peoples knew that a long, long time ago. There is a park in Peru that they call Potato Park. Google it. It's fascinating. Potato Park. They have over 400 varieties of potatoes meaning separate spe subspecies of potatoes. And of course, the potato was generated in the Andes initially. It was exported to Europe later on and actually had immense social and political effects. Some people attribute the rise of Hitler to the potato, ironically. Uh, we, that wasn't what the potato was meant for whatsoever. But the reason it's so important to have a biodiverse food system even within a single type of, of, of food, is because, as may, some of you probably already know, um, they would plant many different potatoes every year. And if it was a drought or if it was a wet year, it didn't matter because one of their potatoes would thrive. This is very similar to the uh, common 
thing people talk about with diversifying your investment portfolio, right? You want to invest in many different sectors because one of them will fail and you want to have something to fall back on. So indigenous folks had understood this concept long, long ago and were implementing it and practicing it. So much so that 70%, this is according to a new film called Gather, which I really um, would, would uh, uh, encourage all of you to watch. It's on indigenous food systems. Um, and it was directed, executive directors, Jason Momoa, AKA Aquaman, but they um, have a beautiful documentary about indigenous food systems and it's called Gather, available I think on iTunes. Um, they uh, threw out a statistic in this film that said 70% of the global variety of foods, we're talking about variety, meaning types of foods, 70% come from the Americas. My people, my ancestors were on it. They were beautiful. And when I go home, you know, and, and really look at the cornfields and make sure uh, that, that, that there's anything I could do to support. It's fascinating how many types of corn my people have. And interestingly, they're smaller sometimes, but that doesn't mean they're less nutritious. Sometimes the smaller foods are more nutritious. I remember going to Via Rica, uh, Peru, um, a couple years ago, and I sat down at the restaurant and they gave me a menu. And on the back was a list of juices I think there was at least 13, 14 different juices I could choose from. They had fruits there that I had never seen or heard of in my life. I mean, gorgeous, crazy oranges where if you cut them in half, there was like four quadrants. It was just, I was just, my, my mind was blown. And I thought to myself, you know, in America, we pretty much just have apple juice or orange juice. That's about it. <laughs> Maybe cranberry juice. But here in Via Rica, Peru, home of the Ashanika indigenous nation, they had uh, diversified their fruits uh, immensely such that they had a, a wide variety to choose from. This is an indication as many natural scientists know of a healthy ecosystem is a vast biodiversity, right? So these are things that we really try to bring back. And we believe that if the world stands a chance of proceeding into the next century. Uh, we would look heavily into indigenous food practices and how they operate, which I know you all understand because that's why we're all here. But I would I would encourage and implore all of us to think about this. You know what um, what is different about indigenous food systems? There's a few key characteristics that I am sort of fumbling around in the dark trying to define as a researcher. One is we do not break what the creator has made. We facilitate what the creator has made. We take care of soil systems. We build living soil systems. We expand habitat such that our food comes to us. Our food and land stewardship practices are designed not in a human-centric way, but in an eco-centric way in that we are not here to feed solely humans, we actually feed everything through these food systems. Uh, another thing I've noticed is a focus on the caloric base of a food web, that we build out that caloric base. Uh, another characteristic I've come across is that indigenous folks are not necessarily um, uh, taking from the land, they are receiving, but it is not extractive. And what I mean by that is by the time we are fed, the system actually is not at a loss. In fact, in many cases, we have actually increased the caloric base by feeding ourselves. So it is not extractive. We're not taking from the system. In the process of feeding ourselves, we are actually simultaneously adding to the system. So it is, it is the opposite of extractive. It is additive. It's an additive food system. Um, another thing, of course, important characteristic is the biodiversity, that we proliferate and diversify genes at every opportunity. 
this means polyculture. There's incredible studies coming out about the Amazon. When we think of the Amazon, we think of pristine, um, magical, perfect, uh, untouched forests that expand forever. Most people don't understand that these forests were anthropogenic, man-made. And I don't mean in a weird way where you're controlling every little thing, but they were intensely facilitated by human hands through the art of what they call terra preta, or the building of black earths, through extensive and, and sophisticated composting practices. And if you just want to Google terra preta, you will find a wealth of information. Of course, it's all refracted through the lens of Western scientific reductionism. So that's unfortunate. Oftentimes, indigenous peoples aren't allowed to speak for themselves about their own food systems. Anthropologists come and write it down and then tell us. But nevertheless, still very fascinating works that have been generated regarding terra preta. So this uh, polyculture, you know, is a characteristic of indigenous food systems. What we find in these studies, these paleoecological studies that really analyze soil cores and figure out what's been going on here for the past 10, 20,000 years, is we find around Mayan settlements in, in Central America, you see a hyper dominance of edible plant species. I think the best word I could find in the English language for this is Eden. Just Eden everywhere you go. Eden over there, Eden over there, Eden over here, and Eden over there. I see Eden all over this continent. Whenever I even barely scratch the surface, you see Eden. Uh, if you if you really look and you know what to look for. And again, this is this is brushing up against scientific racism, right? Because Indigenous peoples are not supposed to be smart enough to do this. We're supposed to be savages, we're supposed to be primitive, and we're supposed to be backward. And we're sure as heck not supposed to be more sophisticated than our European counterparts. Well, we were, and we are, highly sophisticated, far more advanced than our Enlightenment era European counterparts. And that's something they have a really hard time accepting and admitting. They would rather distort data, sweep data under the rug, than admit that. And you see it time and time again in the scientific racism of Amer mostly American scientific communities. It's tragic, and but it's also a lot of headway is being made to disprove these theories that uh, always try to explain away the, the ample evidence that is, is, is right here all around us. Um, so there's quite a few questions. Um, they look like very uh, well thought out questions. Uh, I can go on and on, but maybe I should stop and see what questions there are. Mm -hmm. um, thanks. So Lila, that was amazing. I learned so much in that short amount of time. Some of the things that really stood out to me, one, I just love how you mentioned um, like creating a food system to like lure or seduce um, other species into it. I just I love that, I love that visual. Um, yeah, there are so many great questions here. But before I go through the questions, I just wanna tell everyone that there's actually, we're gonna be screening Gather right after this. So if you wanna watch it, you can at the top of the hour. It's an amazing documentary. Okay, so a question from Jessica is, can you tell us more about the role and value of rituals and celebrations as well as oral history for facilitators of the ecosystem? And I can repeat that too if it, if it was too fast. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, maybe one more time just for everyone else. Yeah. Um, can you tell us more about the role and value of rituals and celebrations, as well as the role and value of oral history for facilitators of the ecosystem? Well, <clears throat> rituals and celebrations in indigenous communities, um, those are both English words, so they won't quite come close to describing what we would do. Uh, and when I say we, I'm really talking about all of humanity because if you go back far enough, 
we were all living this way, um, in, in, in my opinion. Um, so, but okay, so speaking from a Diné context, um, the only issue with the word ritual is that it, it indicates that there's sometimes when there's ceremony and there's sometimes when there's not. Like there's normal life and then, oh, we're going to have a ritual. With Diné people, the ritual was nonstop. Every breath was ritual. Every step was prayer. When the anthropologists came to my people, they thought we didn't have a religion. But it's just that the ceremony never stopped. Uh, even the way we tie our hair is imbued with meaning. Uh, it's it's a specific way of tying it that connects us to the mount, the four sacred mountains. Um, the way that our houses are set up, the hogans, and the way that each part of the house has a different meaning. Um, the way we run to the east every morning at dawn. Uh, everything is life is not sometimes ceremony, sometimes not, it is a constant ceremony. So I think that's something that should be stated, uh, that we tried to live our lives such that it was a constant ceremony. Um, but let's talk about, uh, I mean, there, obviously there are um, different ceremonies that had to do with the distribution of food. Um, for instance, the potlatch, as it's known in the coastal Salish communities, was one and I got to go to one uh, with, in Bella Bella, British Columbia, and it was fascinating. I mean, fascinating is not the right word. It was, it was mind blowing. So much food just being shared with everyone without restraint. I mean, they had probably 2000 people there that they fed uh, uh, breakfast and dinner every day for a few days. It was amazing. And so there are those ceremonies, right? And they're, they're often very connected to giving. Um, for the womanhood ceremony of the Navajo or the Diné, I should say, which is my, my nation, um, we have the uh, four day ceremony and at the end it culminates with the, with the baking of a ceremonial cake. And this cake is baked in the ground as we would bake things uh, and it's made of corn uh, and it's, really grind, the grinded corn over four days. The, the young woman during her womanhood ceremony will grind corn for four days. And at the very end, she creates this huge five foot in diameter cake. And at the end of the whole ceremony, after it's baked, she'll cut it out of the ground and she will actually distribute it to everybody. And she's not allowed to have a single bite. And um, I love that ceremony because it really inculcates this ethic of generosity into the young women. And, and same with the men. There's a um, ceremony among the folks in, in California whereby the young man will hunt his first deer. As he his voice starts to crack and change, he will hunt his first deer. And when he does, he gives the entire deer away to everyone. And that is his introduction to manhood. Can you imagine if that was instituted in the United States where we are training uh, people that their essence, that their value uh, as, as men, women, and non-binary folks, that they are defined by generosity. Um, I think that's the exact opposite of how we uh, initiate men and women in this country today. Um, so anyways, that's what I could say about that. In terms of or oral history, I mean, it's everything. We didn't write things down, not because we couldn't. It was being done all over the, the continent. You know, the Aztecs were doing it. The Mayans were doing it. Some of the Plains tribes were doing it. We knew you how, how to do it. It wasn't like we were too stupid. We chose not to because from, according to my elders, they said it was too easy to lie through the written word. So we chose oral. Uh, oral ways of being. And so it's everything. Our oral history is everything. Our stories are everything. Our teaching in person is everything. And so that's how I'd answer that question. Thank you. Um, it sounds to me like that exchange, the, or, the oral histories and the oral traditions is just like another, the reason why it's done in person, which you just mentioned is because it's easy to lie in the other facets, but it's also like a much more reciprocal form of communication. 
Um, mm -hmm. And someone else asked um, around the role of communication or communicating with other species, they've heard many accounts that deeply communicating with other species is part of co-creating with the rest of nature, these North American indigenous food landscapes. So what is the role of this in the research you've done? Awesome. So the, yeah, so the role of deeply communicating with other species as part of co-creating the um, North American indigenous food landscapes. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, even the term species is a funny term, although I, I use it sometimes for ease of communication. Uh, but there weren't species, they weren't resources, they weren't uh, they were relatives. Relatives is the word we use. So relatives, um, I have a friend, she has a bunch of horses. She doesn't ride them. And people think she's crazy. She said, these are my relatives. I, would you ride your own grandfather? Would you ride your own sister? These are my relatives. I treat them the same way I would treat my own relatives. And so with the buffalo, for example, um, that's we communicated with them all the time through ceremony. A lot of our ceremonies were uh, ways of thanking and, and honoring the beings that gave their lives for us to live. I mean, how many of us here, honestly, would give up your life so that someone else in this conference could live for a day? That's a huge gift. That's a huge gift. And these animals and plants do that for us every day, every day. And what do we give to them? <laughs> what do we give to them? And so these ceremonies are ways of communicating to them our gratitude. And um, so there's a lot of ceremonies that are that in, in integrate different plants and animals, like a buffalo skull, or uh, our, our sweat lodge is made of willows. You know, a lot of our ceremony is occurs within species themselves, within these the bodies of these relatives the bodies of the willows, uh, we actually call them ribs. When we make the sweat lodge, they make ribs of willow to create that dome. And so, you know, we're, we're really in the body of these beings um, as their children. And so it is very different. Uh, the, the buffalo, they, uh, we don't see them as resources. We see them as relatives. We don't see them as um, animal communities, we see them as nations. You know, that's another word you hear a lot, oyate. Oyate is a Lakota word which loosely translates to nation. So when we say buffalo, you know, we say tatanka oyate, the buffalo nation. And we, we engage with them on a nation to nation basis. They have their own government, they have their own needs, they have their own families, they have their own habitats. And so we don't see ourselves as higher at all. We're 100% equal. And so we have to um, respect what their governance structures are and make sure that they intersect with ours in a way that's mutually beneficial. So that's, that's the extent of indigenous diplomacy. I mean, getting along with other humans was baseline. You also had to get along and, and be... Uh, cordial and diplomatic, even with other relatives and nations of other life forms. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. So another question is, um, somewhat, someone, Hannah, is curious about your experience of speaking to academics about indigenous wisdom. Yeah, so I went to Stanford, um, so I definitely, have been through the, the ringer in terms of trying to <laughs> explain these things to academicians. Uh, yeah. Some of, some of whom you will never quite win over, you know? They're deeply entrenched, at least for now. I think we will win over eventually. Um, a lot of people are not ready from what I've been told to accept certain truths. They're not ready. And so sometimes you have to go through the back door. Like for example, they're not ready to accept that indigenous peoples have been here longer 
than what anthropologists have said. Because if Native Americans weren't here that long, then it's okay that we killed them all because they're not really from here. You know, that's the justification. Or if they weren't that many of them, if we weren't very highly populated, then, oh, it's okay. We didn't do much damage. There weren't that many people here anyways. Or if they weren't here that long, then they're, they're immigrants too. They're settlers too. So we, they don't have any more claim to the land than, than um, Columbus did. And so all of these are built into the scientific narrative expressly to support the colonial project, to justify it, to, um, to uh, pacify it. And so when we say these things, that we've been here much, much longer, it's usually met with a lot of, honestly, at the end of the day, racially charged uh, dissent. And so um, going through the back door, you know, I have, a, I have a colleague who has recently published her dissertation on the presence of the indigenous horse prior to Columbus's arrival. And the, the dominant narrative is that the Spanish brought the horse here. They reintroduced the horse, that the horse went extinct during the Ice Age and the Spanish brought the horse. She's saying, no, the horse had always been here. We had always had horses. And she has all of this incredible fossil, fossil data, radiocarbon data, uh, journal entries from explorers, and just proving hands down that the Spanish completely fabricated that idea because the horse symbolized uh, civilization and status. And so if they're coming over here to pacify all these heathens, these uncivilized heathens, and somehow all these uncivilized heathens have all these horses, which at the time, horses were only allowed to be owned by nobility in Spain. They were like the Mercedes Benz of the 1400s and 1500s. So you come to America, all these savages have Mercedes Benzes. It doesn't quite match your justification. And so they actually lied and said, oh, we brought those. We brought those to you. And that lie has persisted and people have conveniently uh, used that lie uh, continually. So that's something people are ready for. They're ready to hear that. So that was the first step that she took. She said, they're not ready to hear other things, but at least they're ready to hear that. And even that she's gotten some resistance on. Um, but her main point was to, as she's talking about horses and horse culture, she has a bunch of them right down the road. They look completely different than your normal horse. They act completely different. Um, that, then if that's not true, that the Spanish lied about this, then what else isn't true? What else has the Eurocentric uh, scientific narrative lied to us about? You know, it sort of opens Pandora's box a bit. And that was her uh, point. So that's sort of an extreme dramatic example of my experience talking with academia. But um, usually, as long as I give the right illustrations, the right examples, it's not too hard to do. I mean, the evidence is in our face. It's not too hard to convince people of what I'm talking about. So um, another question from Sam is, what kind of practical steps might we take away from the present realities of anthropocentric coercion towards the kind of indigenous food system that you've spoken about? So one step, and I know some folks are not in what we now call America, maybe you're in the UK. So, but if you're in what we now call America, a really important step is this whole land back movement. Um, the land back movement is essentially indigenous people saying, hey, um, we would like our land back. <laughs> and, uh, interestingly, it's gaining a lot of traction and you're seeing whole chunks of land being returned to native peoples in some instances. And even if it's a little bit, um, what we need to do is get land in the hands of indigenous peoples who can autonomously uh, create, recreate these food systems. And the importance of that is we need to create models that work. I don't think I could stress that enough. Models that work of the things that I'm talking about. A lot of these models are already happening on indigenous lands as we speak. The health sick are still planting their kelp forests, which is a miracle. I mean, Canada almost wiped them from the face of the planet, but they're still planting those kelp forests. So there's places where those are still going. Where those are still going, that needs to be protected. 
but where it's not going, I'm currently trying to, I, I'm, I'm playing with the idea of getting some land in Kentucky and recreating these chestnut forests, which were beautiful because the American chestnut is almost extinct. And because Eurocentric colonizers don't know how to manage the forests correctly. They never knew how. They they couldn't have. And so uh, that's what I would say is the the steps. Um, I, I will include a link in the uh, chat to give you a little bit more. Um, what do you call it? Uh, fuel to go off of as you consider these things. But um, I I would say number one is get land back to indigenous hands. Uh, number two is support them in the recreation of their food systems. Uh, number three is if it's safe and if, if you've done enough to um, research these things and really understand them, you know, experiment with creating these types of habitat expansion food systems in your own backyard. Uh, and, and fourthly, really telling once we've created those models that work, amplifying them to the world. Because what I was told by my elder is indigenous peoples control enough land to change the way the world thinks about food and water. So that's been my marching orders for the past three years. We have enough land to change the way the world thinks about food and water. So I've been trying my hardest to create those models that change the way the world thinks. And I, I think that that's been slowly happening and maybe that's partially because I'm in this like food bubble, <laughs> but I've definitely like, you know, have been seeing and hearing and learning so much more. Um, so we have about 13 minutes left. So just maybe we can get to like one or two more questions. Um, Alana from the UK asked, how can we in the UK engage with healthy ideas of um, earth stewardship and indigenous indigeneity, I can't talk, uh, while avoiding and challenging the racist narrative that sometimes emerge. For example, people talking about invasive versus like native species. Yeah, so I've been to the UK a couple times um, and to Wales and um, I think, well, okay, so there was a lot of the oak groves uh, prior to the British coming in and, and from what I understand, uh, destroying these oak groves for their um, naval uh, force. So many hundreds of years ago, uh, the UK was deforested uh, very, very brutally, and it has never quite recovered. Um, now what you see in the UK is the proliferation of, of cattle and sheep and those uh, farms that are not really what I'm talking about. Um, not to say that I am an expert in UK indigenous food systems. I am not. But um, I think it would be wonderful to start experimenting with transmuting these pasture lands to the types of biodiverse food systems that I'm talking about. Um, I think I went to uh, Devon, England, and I went to Wis Wisman's Wood. It was the last standing oak grove in, in I, I forget if they said it, and I don't think it was in all of England, but in, in a very large area, it was the last standing oak grove. And the only reason it was still standing is because it was so rocky that the British couldn't come in with their axes and their machinery to, to, to cut it down. And so I think the colonization of the UK absolutely happened. Uh, the British crown um, would go into Scotland and it would first kill the bards, which were the storytellers of Scotland, and they would bury them face down so that their stories would die with them. That is um, something that is, is documented. They, they, they prohibited the Welsh language in the 1930s. If you got caught speaking Welsh, you would get a block of wood around your neck that had the letters WN written on it. Uh, which stood for Welsh knot. And the only way to get this off your neck is if you caught another kid speaking Welsh. I deeply believe that there are ecological systems and paradigms woven into the Welsh language. I think there's a reason why um, these forces try to destroy these languages, a reason why they try to destroy the storytellers, the bards. These things are always interconnected with ecological knowledge. And so I think 
um, part of restoring the ancient food, the ancient Eden, if you will, of um, of the UK is 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 fighting for the languages, fighting for the linguistic diversity. Because I can guarantee you, there are all kinds of goodies embedded and encoded in the Welsh language that we stand a chance of losing. So, um, anyways, I, I think. I think, but to more to most directly answer your question, I'd say I I would love to see experiments in converting that pasture land into biodiverse food systems, natural natural biodiverse food systems, not like uh, intensive agriculture. Um, so you just mentioned language, and uh, someone in the chat had the question of how important are indigenous languages to indigenous territories. Oh, that's a tragic, devastating question. Um, of the 200 some languages that are still spoken in the U in the U.S. and Canada, only 30 are spoken by the children. Uh, you know, it's just something that we've um, pretty much lost, and uh, there's really no measuring or telling what was lost with that. And I'm fighting with all my might. We all are. There's there's 20, 20 speakers left in this one community, the Cheyenne community. And they're all elders and we're in a pandemic. I mean, it's devastating. I mean, the amount of ecological knowledge that is encoded in these languages. I've only shared with you a few words during this talk and it's just, every word is a universe of its own. When you come to it as an English speaker, every word is a universe of its own because we are so locked into this English paradigm that is so impoverished in terms of what it can even talk about, that these languages are absolutely critical. And we have language nests, we're fighting with all our might. In my opinion, the US government should be directing tons of tax dollars to these languages and, and make up for the, the, the intentional and brutal and systematic obliteration of these languages in the boarding school system. My grandma says when she would go to school and a kid would get caught speaking the Nebizad, my language, she said, you'd have to write on a paper a hundred times. I will only speak English. I will only speak English. I will only speak English. Uh, so, so these languages are so important. And I wish I could tell you I had hope for them. But as the days go on, I'm just really quite saddened by the, by the state of them. I, I try as hard as I can to support language programs across the country. I do fundraisers for them all the time. And there's language nests and immersion schools that are popping up and they are our last dying hope. So any, the Karis Children's Learning Center, Aquasasane Freedom School, there's an Eastern Cherokee uh, immersion school. The, the Muscogee have created a full immersion eco village here in Alabama. I mean, we're fight. It's like a wartime effort because these languages will not be here in 50 years. Um, and when the languages go, a lot goes, I'll just say that. Thank you for sharing that. It's really, really heartbreaking. Um, so I think a couple of the last questions left are a little bit more practical. Um, you know what, I'm gonna actually end with a song. Oh yeah, that's yeah. wonderful. Um, and uh, I do have some time, not much, uh, the Real Food Conference will give a Zoom link to everyone where they can um, attend a post Q&A type of thing. But yeah, so I'll just do the song now if that sounds good. Yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. I can't wait. Yeah, thank you, Tiffany, truly. And uh, I appreciate your support and your, your questions throughout this process. Um, okay, so... All right, so this one's called All Nations Rise. Indigenous people, shine your light, we are equal, yeah, yeah. 
I remember the days when our prayers were illegal. I remember the days when being Indian was lethal, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had a rough past, but get ready for the sequel. Get ready for the glorious comeback of our people, yeah. Rise up, all you warriors of love, all you answers to the prayers of our ancestors from above. I could feel it in my heart. Can you feel it in your blood? I could hear the seventh fire calling us to wake up. All nations rise, rise up, cause now's your time. We don't have to hide anymore cause now's our time. With forgiveness as my bow and my prayers as my arrows, pull it back and let go. I watch you fly like sparrows. Have hope, have hope. With compassion as my shield and faith done to my marrow, I will walk the pollen path even when it gets narrow. Yeah, yeah, resurrect. Yes, you can bet that we've seen the single mama raising children on the res. We've seen domestic violence tear apart what we have left. We've seen the alcohol take it all and leave us dead. We've seen the children take their lives when they can't take the dread anymore. No, we can't take the dread anymore. Or, no, I can't take the dread anymore. And I won't take the dread anymore. Yes, it's a war, but we've seen it all before. And now we know we can change it, cause that's why we were born. We know we are the ones that we have been waiting for. Yes, we are the ones that grandma has been praying for. So rise up, all you warriors of love. All you answers to the prayers of our ancestors from above. I could feel it in my heart. Can you feel it in your blood? I could hear the seventh fire calling us to wake up. Pueblo hermoso, levántase es nuestro tiempo. No tienes que esconderte más, porque ahorita es nuestro tiempo. This next verse is in Spanish to honor all the indigenous peoples south of that imaginary border, which has divided a continent that was once very much connected. Mujer indígena, tú eres tan sagrada y traigas medicina de tu suelo todavía. A pesar del abuso de tu cuerpo y tu tierra, respetamos tus ancestros y la suya cultura, hombre indígena. Tú eres honorable y yo veo la fuerza que todavía sobrevive a pesar del abuso de tu raza venerable. Yo respeto tus ritos, tus danzas, tus padres, guerreros del amor y guerreros de la paz. Sí, no vamos a escondernos más. We are warriors of love. We are warriors of peace. We will not hide ourselves anymore. All nations rise. Rise up, cause now's your time. We don't have to hide anymore, cause now's our time. Yeah. That was beautiful. Right. Thank you so much for sharing. So um, I believe there is a link in the Zoom or in the chat for folks who wanted to hop into a Zoom um, for some more Q and A, and then for other people, there's you know some great talks coming up. Uh, one with um, Rupa, Myra, and Raj Patel, and there's also the gather screening. So there's a lot of great options to choose from. But thank you so much, Lila. It was amazing to hear from you, to hear your wisdom and your music. I just really appreciate you and the work that you are doing. Oh, thank you, sis. It's all for creator and for creation. And there's so many of us doing it. I'm just one of many and I'm honored to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>